This flash in the sky is believed to mark the moment when the Iranians allegedly shot down a passenger plane within their own airspace just after takeoff. The plane has caught fire, another eyewitness says. In the name of God, help us, call the fire department. As the Ukrainian jet falls out of the sky southwest of Tehran airport. 82 Iranians were among those killed. American intelligence says the plane was targeted by surface-to-air missiles. If true, this looks like a catastrophic mistake by a missile crew on alert for an American attack instead, though the Iranians deny it. What we can say with absolute certainty is that no missile has hit this plane. As I said last night, the plane travelled while on fire for more than a minute and a half, and the crash site shows that the pilot had decided to return. The Iranians have produced the plane's so-called black boxes, which contain flight data and the cockpit's voice recorder. They say both were undamaged, and that if they can, they will extract the information themselves. Though for now, it seems there were too many Iranian casualties for Tehran to even contemplate the assessment of the Americans and Canadians. Uh, we, we do believe that it's likely that that plane was shut down by an Iranian missile. Uh, we are, we're going to let uh, the investigation play out before we make a final determination. It's important that we get to the bottom of it. Uh, the evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. This may well have been unintentional. The Foreign Secretary was in Canada himself last night and he agreed. The Iranian regime must open up to the international community including access to the crash site so we can get the truth as quickly as possible. A Canadian journalist at the crash site said Iranian officials had removed nearly all the wreckage leaving the site open to scavengers. American, French and Canadian experts have been invited to investigate themselves, but how open the Iranians will be in practice is now in question. Oh. It's coming our way, said another eyewitness as the plane crashed. The Ukrainians say they're happy with Iran's cooperation so far. <laughs> But as the morning continues, from Tehran to Kiev to here in Toronto, there's mounting doubt that mechanical failure really was the cause. Well, Jonathan joins me now. Um, Jonathan, what evidence is there that the plane was shot down? Well, a Western security official has told me that the main evidence comes from heat-sensitive American satellites, which picked up what they call heat signatures of what they believe to be missiles heading towards the plane when it was flying at about 8,000 feet, so pretty low in the sky, about two minutes after takeoff. Now, Ukrainian investigators are on the ground. They're not going that far. They say they are treating either a missile strike or terrorism as the most likely lines of inquiry, but I think they don't want to upset their Iranian hosts. In the last 20 minutes, the Iranians have officially said they will give the world an explanation tomorrow. But as things stand, it looks as if they're missing a trick to come clean, to admit some kind of responsibility, because this is a regime under immense pressure. After all, it lost 59 of its own people in a stampede at General Soleimani's funeral earlier this week. Hundreds were reported killed last year when the government opened fire on its own people in anti-government protests. And now you've got Donald Trump tonight imposing more sanctions on a country which has already lost 80 percent of its oil revenue. I think this terrible crash could be a bridge to reconciliation. It could get people who don't like each other to talk to one another. But at the end of a week in which we saw both sides almost on the brink of a war, it's not looking like any kind of bridge to anywhere this evening. Jonathan, thanks very much. Well, joining me now from Toronto is Bijan Ahmadi, who's former president of the Iranian-Canadian Congress and founder of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. How badly, Bijan Ahmadi, would you say this has affected the Iranian community in Canada? Uh, first, thanks for having me. Uh, the Iranian-Canadian community is relatively a significant population. We're around 300,000 uh, people in Canada. 
uh, from Iranian background. Uh, however, it is still a very uh, close-knit community. Uh, so when I talk to friends uh, here, uh, almost all of us, uh, we know people or have friends who have lost loved ones. So it has been devastating uh, for uh, overall. It's really a Canadian tragedy, but especially for the Iranian Iranian Canadian community, it has been uh, it has been uh, very uh, very bad, and 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 we have lost many people on that flight. And when you think about the sort of uncertainty and speculation and this international sort of tit for tat and blame game that's going on, how has that affected people in the community? Unfortunately, it's making it worse, this confusion that exists, this uncertainty. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau yesterday uh, talked about uh, the evidence that they have uh, regarding uh, the, the a missile uh, shooting down the, uh, the flight. So after that, the confusion and the uncertainty is even more. And I, I believe that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is right when he is calling for transparency and accountability. Uh, I hope that the Iranian government provides full access to investigators, but I also hope that uh, the government of Canada and Prime Minister Trudeau also publicly provide the evidence and the documents, the intelligence that they have, that based on that, they came up with the preliminary conclusion that mentioned yesterday. People, and especially the families who lost loved ones, they have the right to know the truth. Bijan Ahmadi, thank you very much for joining us. Matt. Thank you. It's but, I think it's me. <laughs> joining me now from <laughs> Leeds is Malcolm Chalmers, Deputy Director uh, General of the Independent Think Tank, the United, Royal United Services Institute for Defence and Security. Thanks for coming on the programme, uh, Mr Chalmers. I mean, we just heard Jonathan Rugman saying that there will be a press conference, a statement given by the Iranians tomorrow. Do you expect them to double down on their denial that they had anything to do with this? I don't think we can predict what they will do. It's very hard for them to admit to responsibility, but the evidence increasingly points in that direction. The, the Iranians are now under a multiple source of pressure. So they, they've shown by the relatively limited nature of their counter-strike against Iraq that they weren't willing to risk going to an all-out war uh, with the United States. And uh, they must be wondering whether some of the more aggressive steps they've taken in recent months, notably that attack on the, on the Saudi oil facilities, mm. are backfiring. And, and Donald Trump seems to be, you know, doubling down for his part on the pressure by adding more sanctions to an economy Indeed. that's already struggling enormously. How does this, especially this crash, you know, and what looks like a very tragic mistake, change the geopolitical calculations of the last seven days? It remains to be seen whether it will do so. It must be a blow to the confidence of the regime, the, the psychological makeup, because it really hits at uh, the competence of the regime. It's, it's quite possible that in at a time when Iranian air defence units would have been primed for American retaliation, uh, a mistake was made. Uh, there's no suggestion, I think, the Iranians would have deliberately targeted a civilian airliner with so many of their own citizens on board. Uh, but clearly an awful error was made and it doesn't reflect well on competence. And uh, that's, uh, I think, strikes at the heart of the, of the credibility of the regime to its own people. And does it make any further retaliation uh, for the killing of General Soleimani any less likely? I don't think it makes it less or more likely. I think the limited nature of that, those missile attacks on American bases in Iraq was really very significant. On the one hand, it showed that the Iranians had the capability for very accurate targeting uh, to deliberately avoid civilians. Uh, so in that sense, it showed they had a capability which some analysts uh, were, were doubtful of. But on the other hand, it showed that they respected Donald Trump's red line of not targeting American personnel, even in retaliation uh, for the, the killing of a very senior Iranian government official. And I think one of the questions will be whether this is now giving the United States a freer hand to target further IRGC personnel when they're up to no good, as the Americans would mm. see it in Yemen or elsewhere. There's already a report uh, tonight of a, of a failed American attempt to kill a, a senior IRGC official in Yemen.
Uh, what about uh, the point that Jonathan Rogman was making earlier, that this is also potentially, theoretically, an opportunity for some kind of bridge of reconciliation? That seems rather unlikely at the moment, doesn't it? I think the, uh, after the, uh, the lack of any visible American response to the attack on the Saudi oil facilities, there was quite a bit of uh, reporting of feelers being put out not least between Saudi and Iran, all very uh, preliminary uh, stuff. But I, mean, I think a lot of that is, is going on. But I think what the Americans are saying, what I think uh, the, America, uh, the United States Arab allies will be saying is that Iran needs to be prepared to make some real concessions, not only in the nuclear file, uh, mm. but also on the extent to which right. it's playing a very active role uh, across the region. And that's going to be very difficult for this Iranian government to accept. And in one quick line, uh, um, Mr. Chalmers, a week ago, exactly a week ago, we were worried about a wider conflict. I mean, some people were talking about, you know, mm. World War Three, and it was, you know, you know over-egging the pudding somewhat. Now, today, I mean, we seem to be in a much better place, don't we? We do, but we could be back at that position in a week's time from now. It, it's a very dangerous, difficult game. I really do not see this Iranian government folding anytime soon. And I think the United States has gained new confidence as a result of these events and, and these new sanctions mm. demonstrate that they feel sanctions work, which I think they are in terms of uh, crippling the Iranian economy. But I think it's entirely possible we'll have a long period in which Poverty rises in Iran, there's more unrest in Iran, a big right. domestic crisis in Iran, uh, but not, and that may encourage Iran to, to lash out rather than to soften. We just don't know. We don't know. Malcolm Chalmers, thanks very much indeed. Kathy. Thanks, Matt. Well, in neighbouring Iraq, several months of protests in central Baghdad have received new impetus since the assassination of the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani. Thousands have taken to the street to vent their anger at the government, the United States and Iran. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, is in Baghdad. Lindsay. Cathy, day 101 of anti-government protests here in Baghdad. But there really is now a focus on Iran more than anything else. And America, outside interference. The Americans for using this place, Iraq, as their to kill um, General Soleimani and the Iranians for firing at Americans here. The Shia militia here, who are sponsored by Iran, have in the past attacked the demonstrators. They've killed more than 500. Today, they didn't do that here in Baghdad. Why? Maybe because the main Shia cleric here, Ayatollah Sistani, suggested today that he was with the protesters. He said in his Friday sermon that no Outsiders, no foreign powers, should dictate Iraq's fate. Keep your conflicts away from Iraq, they say. No to America and no to Iran. Why should they face each other here? They can solve their problems somewhere else. Iran and America, they never wanted uh, stability in Iraq. They want to transfer their differences here on our land. Killing Soleimani in our land was a mistake. This country is not sovereign anymore. Months of protest forced the Iraqi prime minister to step down. But for those manning the barricades, that's not enough. In 2003, the US invasion overthrew Saddam Hussein. This generation wants to overthrow the religious political parties that replaced him. These protests are about democracy and an end to corrupt government. Also an end to outside interference. People have been saying to me, we don't want the Americans here anymore. But much more passionately, they say, Iran out of Iraq. This is our country. The writing on the wall the names of more than 500 people killed by Iranian-sponsored militia and unknown men in black balaclavas over 101 days of protest. Today, security forces were chasing demonstrators on the streets of Basra. Journalist Ahmed Abdul Samad questioned why those who protest against the US are not arrested, whereas those who oppose Iran are. Three hours later, he and his cameraman were shot dead in their car.
معروف ايران نو جود ويز عراقي ايران كل عراقي كل عراقي ايران كل عراقي ايران كل بيبي زي ديبرس اس زي كل اس زي زي هاف ميليشيا هير They have militia. Militia belong to to her. To Iran. No, no, to to Iran. Belong to Iran. The system, the system of militia, belong to Iran. Some Iraqi politicians say the Americans pay people to protest. That's all what I have. That's all what I have. It's almost. It's almost. $35. People post their wishes. Personal. I want to marry, but no girl will have me, said one. Or political. Can you tell me what you wrote? Iraq backs to Iraq. People. Iraq back to the Iraqi people. Yeah. This is your wish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dance, dance wherever you may be. They're mocking Shia sheikhs in black turbans and Sunnis in their white and red hats. Young Iraqis have had enough of sectarian politics and foreign powers. They want to turn the whole system upside down. Now, Prime Minister Abdel Mahdi is supposed to have stepped down, but he hasn't actually gone anywhere. He's still in position in an acting capacity. He spoke to the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, last night. They have rather different versions of what was said. Uh, Abdul Mahdi said, we are discussing the American withdrawal from Iraq as must happen because that's what the parliament wants. But the State Department has put out a statement saying Ira um, American troops aren't going anywhere. They're staying here in Iraq. But diplomatic sources I've spoken to say, you know, America's days here are numbered. They will eventually, maybe over the next year, be forced to withdraw. And other countries are going to have to step up to fight the remnants of Islamic State here. The other thing that the uh, State Department said, which not everybody would agree with in this region, was America, it said, is a force for good in the Middle East.